Welcome to our lecture online. Now here we have an example where Gauss's law is very handy to use to solve this problem. For example, we have a small charge object that has charge Q1 on it, where Q1 is equal to minus 2 microcoulombs, and that charge is placed within a hollow cylind cylindrical sphere that is a conductor that has an outside and inside surface, so there's air in between where Q1 resides, and then we put on that conductor a charge Q2 equal to 3 microcoulombs. The inside radius of the large sphere is 2 meters and the outside radius is 2.4 meters, so the thickness of that conductor is 0.4 meters. But since it's a conductor, we can only expect charge to be residing on the surface. But I haven't quite placed a charge there yet because there's going to be some interaction between the charge Q1 and the charge Q2 on the cylindrical or yeah, the, the uh, spherical, not cylindrical, but spherical conductor. So first, realizing we're going to put a negative charge right here. And that negative charge is equal to minus 2 microcoulombs. That's equal to minus 2 microcoulombs. And then we place a positive 3 microcoulombs on that conducting sphere. Now, how will that 3 microcoulombs distribute itself? Well, two of those 3 microcoulombs will reside on the inner surface because there'll be a force of attraction between the negative charges here and the positive charges in the conductor. So we're going to end up with some of the charges on the inside surface, like that, and some of the charge, the remaining one microcoulomb, is going to reside on the outside surface. Now I'm trying to put the same ratio in there, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, so that means I'm going to have, hmm, let me change that, now let's make it 8, and so then we'll have 4 of these, 1, 2, 3, Four. I'm trying to draw the, the plus signs representing positive charges in the correct ratio. So if 3 microcoulombs corresponds to 12 of these charges, whatever these charges are, then 8 of them, 2 thirds of them, will reside on the inner surface and 1 third of them will reside on the other outer surface. So there's a total of 3 microcoulombs on the outside spherical conductor. However, Two of the three microcoulombs will reside on the inner surface because they're being attracted to this negative two microcoulombs, and on the outside surface there will be one microcoulomb on the outside surface. All right, now we're ready to find the electric field at the various locations. The first location is at about the halfway point from the negative charge to the inside surface of the conductor, one meter away from the center. The second point, so this is where we want to find E1. The second position will be at E2 being somewhere halfway between the inner and the outside surface, right there. So we'll call that E2. And then finally, E3 will be well outside the outside surface, right there. So this will be E3. And again, we're trying to find the strength of the electric field there. All right. So we're going to find the general equation, again, using, using uh, Gauss's law. So we have the strength of the electric field times the area of the surface is equal to Q inside divided by epsilon sub naught. And we're going to solve that for E. So E is equal to Q inside divided by the area times epsilon sub naught, which is equal to Q inside divided by 4 pi r squared times epsilon sub naught. And of course, again, realizing that 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub naught is equal to K. We can then write this as the electric field. is going to be equal to Q inside times K divided by R squared. And of course, that's the equation we would get for the electric field for a point charge. And we've learned in the previous video that if we have a charge distribution which is spherical, once we have a Gaussian surface that's outside that, that encloses all of that charge, all that charge acts as a point charge, even though it's distributed along the surface of a sphere. So the first Gaussian surface is going to be drawn where the surface is going to go through this point right here. So this is going to be the first Gaussian surface, like that. And so applying this equation to that, we can say that E1 is equal to K times the charge enclosed. 
So in this case, that's going to be just a minus two microcoulombs of charge, minus two microcoulombs, divided by the distance from there to the surface. So that would be one meter, and we have to square that. So this is equal to nine times 10 to the ninth, multiply times. Now, what about the negative sign? Well, even though there's a negative charge there, we're just looking for the magnitude of the electric field, not the direction. The direction will indeed be from positive charges to negative charges, so you can see that the direction of the electric field will indeed be from the inner surface to the negative charge inside. So there will be an electric field that looks like this inside the sphere. And so you can think of that negative as being kind of the indication that the electric field is in, inwards instead of outward, but we don't really need the negative sign for that because we're looking for the magnitude of the electric field. So we're simply going to put the positive two microcoulombs there, divided by, oh, and let me write this as two times 10 to the minus six, and then one squared, like this. So what's the strength of the electric field at that location? Nine e to the ninth times two e to the six minus, and that would be 18,000 newtons per coulomb. So E1 has a magnitude of 18,000 newtons per coulomb. And if you want to write that in vector format, that would be equal to E1. In vector format is equal to minus 18,000 newtons per coulomb in the radial direction. That's the R unit vector. And the reason why we write it with a negative sign is because that then does indicate that the electric field is pointed inward rather than outward, and there's the negative, but we don't write it as the magnitude of the vector. The next thing we're going to do is draw a Gaussian surface to find E2. Like this. And so we can say here that E2 is going to be equal to, using the same equation, we're going to write this as k times q enclosed all divided by the distance r2 squared. So this is going to be equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th times the charge inside the second Gaussian surface. Now notice we have a minus 2 microcoulomb charge right here, and we have a positive 2 microcoulomb charge on the, uh, on the inside of that sphere, and 1 microcoulomb on the outside, but that's outside the Gaussian surface. So here we can see that we have a minus two microcoulombs plus two microcoulombs. So essentially a net charge of zero inside the second Gaussian surface divided by 2.2 meters squared. So since this is equal to zero, we can see that the electric field inside or between the inside and outside surface of that outside conductor must be equal to zero no electric field in there. And finally, when we try to find E3, we're going to draw a Gaussian surface like this. And so now we can say that E3 is equal to K times Q inside, all divided by R3 squared. So that's equal to nine times 10 to the ninth. Multiply times the Q inside. Now we have all the charge enclosed both Q1 and Q2, so in that case, we have minus 2 microcoulombs plus 3 microcoulombs, all divided by, and that would be 2.5 meters squared, like that. And so that means, let me rewrite this, so this is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th, multiply times 1 times 10 to the minus 6, all divided by 2.5 squared. There we go. So we have 9e to the 9th times 1e to the 6 minus divided by 2.5 squared equals, and now we have an electric field equal to 1,440 newtons per coulomb. Obviously a much weaker field because the total charge enclosed in that case is much less, only one a net charge of one microcoulomb, and we're 2.5 meters away from the center of that charge, so to speak. And so that's the result for the third electric field, E3. We got zero for E2, and we have 
18,000 newtons per coulomb for E1. And that's how it's done.